Hello there, and welcome to another Humankind video. I'm Lord Lambert, and today we're going to be having a look at the cultures in Humankind. Now, you know, you know the feeling when you've just got the requirements to level up to the next era, but you don't know who's best, what will synergize with how you're playing, and, you know, basically who you should choose. This video attempts to go through that and basically decide who exactly is the best in humankind, and we're going to do that via the classic tier list. So let's get into this, let's find out who is best and who is worst, starting off with the Assyrians. Now, the Assyrians have a couple of things going for them, but also a couple of drawbacks. First off, they're expansionists, and expansionist civs in, the, in humankind right now are a little bit weak. Mostly because of the Era Stars, it is very difficult to earn the required Era Stars when you are Expansionist, and considering you get extra fame for Expansionist Stars, uh, this really can put you on a bit of a back foot. Uh, permanently, they get Raid Masters. They get more land movement speed on their units, and plus 5 combat strength when ransacking on the army. Um, the movement strength speed is great. Uh, this will last you for the entirety of the game, and it's great. It is fantastic. However, combat strength on ransacking isn't really going to carry you that far. Um, the way that you would make use of this is to have your units always ransacking and trying to take battles um, where, say, half of your army is ransacking and then another half engages the enemy, therefore you get the extra five combat strength. It's a little finicky. Uh, it can be done right, but it is it's just a bit awful, really. Um, you also have uh, the ability to create the Dunu, which is a defensive fortification building. It'll give you plus one common strength uh, for units in or adjacent to the district. It gives you a little bit of influence, so it's nice to have that early influence boost in the ancient era. Uh, but overall, it's probably a pretty weak emblematic quarter. And then finally, you have the Assyrian Raiders. 21 combat strength is really good for the Ancient Era, and if you're wanting to do a an early Era Rush build, uh, then you can't really go wrong with a bit of Assyrian in this. They are pretty good at that. Um, putting all that together, though, including you kind of look fantastic when you take them, I don't rate the Assyrians too terribly highly. Uh, I think they're probably a C tier. Um, it's between C and D tier, so once we get through the rest of the Ancient Era, maybe I'll swap them around a little bit. But for now, I'm feeling I'm feeling C tier is probably pretty pretty accurate for them. I will be putting all of these cultures up against others in the same era, rather than rating cultures against you know two or three eras ahead. I don't think that's really fair. But for now, Assyrians C tier that works for me. Moving on to the Babylonians now. Scientist Civ, always really nice, uh, especially in the late game. Um, early game, science doesn't really do a massive amount of benefits for you. Uh, it does mean that you can go through the first era without trying to focus on science, without getting any... Um, well, you can't build the research quarter anyway, so you're, you're not going to be you know rushing science. You can't have too many researchers. Um, so this will give you an early leg up, but when so many other things are a little bit more important and you can find science by the curiosities, uh, scientists is really amazing. Definitely this is something to look out for for the later tiers or the later eras, but certainly in the ancient era, science just isn't massively beneficial. You also get Brilliant Philosophers. This will last you for the entirety of the game, plus two science per research technology or capital. This can be great. Um, thinking if you get into the uh, the industrial era, you're looking at around about 40 technologies. If you get, you know, 80 extra science per 40 technologies, it's, it's okay. But by the industrial era, you're also probably making somewhere in the region of 1,000 to 2,000. Hell, if you've gone French, then you're could be making five to ten thousand so this extra bit of science isn't going to do too much again um, it doesn't mean that you can go through the ancient era just a little bit faster and maybe that is something you will be really wanting to get get that boost up on your AI or human uh, rivals it's okay 
Uh, moving on, we've got the Astronomy House Emblematic Quarter, plus three science per adjacent Farmer's Quarter, uh, which is fantastic. Um, you get plus one food per researcher, plus one science per researcher, and an extra researcher slot. It counts as a Farmer's Quarter, it counts as a Research Quarter. This is a phenomenal Emblematic Quarter, one of the best, and definitely brings alone this culture up a tier in the list. Um, it scales very well, is, is the main part of this. Uh, giving you an extra food per researcher and an extra science per researcher really means that you are not having to worry about balancing between food and research. You don't have to decide, oh well, I want to grow my population faster, but also I want to research a little bit faster. You can do kind of both. Uh, so really the Astronomy House is a very, very good amount quarter for that. And then finally we have the military unit, the Sabu Sakasti. Uh, 22 strength is very good, anti-cavalry as well, especially in the ancient area. You're going to be coming across uh, barbarians, these uh, you know non-aligned um, enemies are roaming the map. And in the ancient era, they really do quite like their chariots. And if you have Sebu Sikasti, you have spears, you're anti-cavalry. Uh, so you're going to be able to deal so much more damage to the chariots of the enemy. Uh, it's also strong when standing in a friendly district. I haven't found this to be too emblem uh, impactful. You're generally not going to be attacked in the ancient era uh, and having to defend uh, your cities. But battlefields can um, occasionally spill into your cities, so you can you can fight and and use this guardian unit class ability. Um, the downside is it does require a little bit of copper, but it is one of the early resources that you will be wanting to get, so it's not bad. It's it's pretty good. Babylonians, I think because of the Astronomy House, I'm going to pop it in A tier. Uh, without the Astronomy House, it would be going down. And again, I may do a reshuffle after I've finished through these ancient era uh, civilizations. Moving on though, we have the Egyptians and one of, if not the best civilizations in the game. I don't think too many people are going to be disagreeing with this one. Egyptians, I believe, are one of the most picked civilizations for the ancient era. And, you know, it, it, it's pretty reasonable why. Firstly, you are a builder sieve. You can make use of this um, land razor ability at any level of the game, uh, basically turning all of your money, your science, into industry uh, getting those buildings out just that little bit faster it is useful at any level of the game um, even in the ancient era so yeah builders really really good you also gain stability when completing a district's construction in the ancient era this isn't doing much uh, you're generally not going to be coming across issues with stability in the ancient era and if you are something's gone wrong uh, but yeah build a star absolutely fantastic uh, so yeah just that that's really good Moving on, we have our uh, ability here that will last you the entirety of the game, Grand Planners. Plus one industry on tile producing industry. At first glance, it doesn't look too terribly massive. You know, a wood will provide you an extra one industry. Woohoo, who cares? Um, but that's not really the whole story. This negative 10% on district industry cost is the thing that you're looking at here. Um, districts can cost quite a hefty amount and saving 10% throughout the entirety of the game cannot go unsniffed. You can't sniff at that, unsniff, whatever. Um, it's fantastic. Uh, this will save you so many turns of build time over the course of a game that getting Egyptians in the early stages is just fantastic. Um, this, is, this is great. Their emblematic quarter, also really, really good. You get some influence. Influence in the early game is hard to come by. It's probably one of the most precious resources, so getting plus one on every single one of your Egyptian pyramids is definitely worth it. You get plus three industry. Really cool. It's it's nice. Um, you know, you can't go wrong with a bit more industry. Uh, plus three industry per adjacent maker's quarter. If you manage to get two ancient pyramids next to each other, say you're on a, uh, the border of a uh, two regions or even three regions and you manage to get like a triangle of egyptian pyramids you are going to be rolling in industry uh in the early game plus three per adjacent makers quarters which includes the egyptian pyramid you could also surround an egyptian pyramid in makers quarters it's fantastic you also get plus one worker slot uh per um one of these egyptian pyramids 
in the early game. This is just, uh, it's just fantastic. It is a beautiful and amazing emblematic quarter. And it's, yeah, it, this alone brings it up. This brings it up. This brings it up. And moving on to their their unit, we have the Markabarta, which is a chariot with a bow on it, um, which it's it's much better than you would expect, right? Uh, the fact that they can shoot and then move again means that this is an incredibly survivable unit. Um, you can have situations where you know you're outnumbered, you're outstrengthed, and you may lose. However, you've got your marker battle, you can move into range, you can shoot, then you can get out of there again, and you can win fights that are against the odds because of this. It requires horses. Generally, you know, horses and copper are going to be the, the resources you're looking for early game, so you're not going to have too many issues with it. Uh, but yeah, it's a great unit, and because of literally everything in this Civ being fantastic, the Egyptians are going in S tier. I don't think anyone is going to have too much of an issue with that. Harapans! Next is another really, really good Civ. Uh, fun fact, Harapans was the first Civ I ever played in Humankind uh, back in like August 2019 when I was invited to do a little um, alpha test. Uh, we got to play through the Ancient Era and Harapans with the guys that I used. Uh, one thing that the Harapans do is, you know, they're not very into warfare, uh, but I conquered everyone on the continent with me because the Harapans are just that good. Um, they are a food civilization or an agrarian civilization. They gain seven stability every time they gain a population, and you will be gaining population very, very quickly. Um, their greener pastures action isn't something I've used too terribly much. Especially in the ancient era, you're just not going to be wanting to spend influence on these kinds of things. Influence is going to be used either for your wonders or for claiming territory, and spending influence to get one population from an adjacent ally, enemy, whatever, is not worthwhile. So that's that's something to ignore, but 7 stability when gaining population is fantastic, and like I said, you're going to be gaining population because these guys are food related. We have fertile inundations, plus one food on towel, producing food, and plus one food on river. Generally you're going to be wanting to start your cities on rivers to make you know advantage of the amount of food that are on them getting that just a little bit boosted is great and this again will last you the entirety of the game just making it so that you're never really going to be having a struggle for pop growth um you take harapans in the early game and throughout the game no matter what other kinds of sids you choose if they're builders scientists whatever you're not going to really have an issue where you're running out of food um because this is just that good uh, Canal Network, another really good um, emblematic quarter. You get plus three food, you get plus three food per adjacent Marker's Quarter. Uh, Marker's Quarter? Farmer's Quarter, my apologies. And it counts as a Farmer's Quarter. This is basically the food version of the Egyptian Pyramid, and they are just as good. Um, the Canal Network can get you 20 food, depending on where you place it um, in the early game, and you know, you're just going to have a really good time with it if you can um, stack these next to each other, put some farmers or, uh, outposts next to each other. It's just really, really good as a an early game emblematic quarter. You're not going to have any problems with it. And finally, we have the runner, which is a replacement for the scout unit. Uh, the um, And it's good. It's good. It's not really a combat unit. As you can see, 14 strength is much, much weaker than... Um, the 20 something that we saw from the Markabada from the Sabu Sikasti, uh, but it's not a melee unit really. Uh, it is a scout, and as such, it ignores movement penalty through forests, which means its movement of five, which is higher than you know your standard infantry unit of four, is going to be able to explore the map much, much easier, um, potentially finding uh, wonders of the world, natural, natural wonders like. Um, Halong Bay, like um, the the mountains and stuff. I can't remember the natural wonders, but you know, they're really good. Um, trying to find those is going to give you a good boost in the early game, and the runners are good. They're not a combat unit though, don't try and use them there. Where do I put the Harapans? It's very easy. The Harapans go in S tier alongside the Egyptians. Both of these civs are phenomenal and will really set you up well for the entire game. Uh, they're not just useful in the ancient era, it's not a set and forget. It is something that is going to be felt throughout the entire game as such. 
S tier is the only place that the Harrow Hounds belong. Moving on to the Hittites, we have our first militarist civilization. And they are pretty good. All right, so the Militarist Star, you get war support, um, equilibrium value on relations, plus 30. What this means is you will always be able to go to war with somebody that you don't have positive relations with um, without it being a surprise war. You need 80 war support to go to war um, and the base value is 50. So you're going to always be at 80. And if you can go to war without needing to worry about your um, your crises, your war support, you're going to have a good time. Um, Hittites are one of the best early game rush civs, and yeah, the uh, this is a big part of the reason why. Um, can periodically call upon patriots to take up arms in defense of the motherland. Basically, you, you spawn troops. I've never really used too much of it. Um, but it's uh, it's a, another one of those things that uses influence, and anytime you've got one of these early era influence kind of actions, I don't rate it. Um, it is not useful because you really want, in the early stages in the ancient era, to save your influence. Um, you also get here plus one combat strength on all your units for the entirety of the rest of the game. Fantastic. Um, this will definitely come into its own in the ancient in the classical it falls off a little bit as when you go further but always you're if you get plus one combat strength you're just going to be having a happy time um so definitely recommend you know going for something like this if you're a very warlike uh kind of player their emblematic district is the awari um, it automatically upgrades a regular outpost this means that all of your outposts your you're the outpost capital um, will upgrade to an Awari. It can be used as a land spawn unit for neighbor cities uh, without being attached to it. Um, but that's it. That's all it really does. Uh, you don't need to attach your outposts to your cities to have units spawn from it, is basically what this does. Um, it's also fortified, so if you're on the defensive, um, you, can, you can use that as the outpost as well as a defensive location. But... It really doesn't play into the uh, Hittite strength on this uh, fortification, right? It does play into it that you can get your troops to the front as fast as possible because, you know, you are, if you're taking the Hittites, you want the early war. You want to be knocking people out of the game in the ancient era. Uh, so being able to spawn units much closer to them, you pop down an outpost, you spawn some units in that, from a city that's like four or five districts away, um, you're having a good time. Uh, especially when you can spawn the Gigir. It takes horses and copper, but it is a fantastic chariot unit. Um, when you attack with it, the enemy unit cannot move and has reduced combat strength for the next turn. That's fantastic. That is so nice because it means that you can run in with your Gigirs, hit the enemy, and then when they try and attack you back, Firstly, you're on the defensive, so you get that little combat strength bonus, and also they are weaker, so you're just doubling down on, on a defensive bonus. It is something that you should use the, on anything that's like threatening maybe your archers, or maybe just uh, threatening any units that you don't have, um, you know, you don't want them to die. Gigear is really, really good. Um, it's a fantastic early game unit. I think the Gigear is something that will raise the Hittites a tier, uh, but in general I don't think it is a massively good sieve unless you're going for that early game knockout. Uh, say you're on a small Pangea world, uh, you're playing um, in an area where there are enemies really close to you, you can march your army over onto their border, uh, declare them without them knowing it's coming because of your plus um, 30 war support bonus and just knock them out very very quickly without them knowing it's coming um for that i'd say the hittites probably belong in the b tier um i think that's pretty much fair also they look pretty cool but most civs do so whatever mycidians another combat civ so they look even cooler i think and they have that same plus 30 war support equilibrium value um, so everything I just said about the Hittites also applies to Mycenaeans. Where they differ is their buildings, their all, all of this. 
So, first off, Brutal Uprising is plus negative 20% on unit industry cost. This will last you throughout the entire game and is phenomenal. Plus experience on creating unit on city or outpost. Another really phenomenal bonus that will just give you that extra boost. Um, 25 experience, I not I don't think it's enough to get you one star immediately. I may be wrong on that one, actually. Um, but what it is is something that will um, really give you a, an edge um, even if it isn't giving you that star, it gets you closer to it. And once you get that star, you get some combat strength bonus, uh, which is exactly what the uh, Hittites were doing, is giving that combat strength bonus. So, yeah, Brutal Uprisings, really, really good. That 20% unit industry cost will carry you throughout the entire game, um, saving you man many turns of um, industry cost uh, when, you know, building your armies to have combat in the late game. We also have the Cyclopean Fortress, um, giving you industry and stability, uh, combat strength on units in or adjacent to it, and it also counts as a maker's quarter. It's a really good building, uh, mostly defensive because of that combat strength bonus, but it gives you industry and it gives you a lot of stability. Um, early game, the stability is not going to matter so much, but once you get into later eras, that 15 stability can be the difference between uh, being a calm city and not being a calm city. So, yeah, that's really cool. Uh, it also counts as a maker's quarter, so you can surround this by other maker's quarters to get that industry bonus, uh, which is really good. We also have their, their unit, the Pro McCoy. Uh, it is stronger when attacking during the first round, so you can get that early alpha strike over, um, get that enemy really very hurt when they counterattack in their round. They're not going to do as much. Um, it's, it's great. It's a good unit. It's pretty strong, 21 strength. Um, it's, it's, worth, it's worth using. Um, Overall, though, I think I would say it is better than the Hittites, um, but not by a massive amount, and I don't think it's better than them by enough to put them in A tier. So I'm going to put them in B tier, but I'm going to put them closer to the B. I think that would be a bit more fair. Um, again, once we've finished these Ancient Era sieves, we can go in and scramble them up a bit again, see if there's anything better that comes along. Next up, the Nubians. Nubians are our first uh, merchant sieve. Um, it uses influence to use its action. Um, what it can do is actually really good in the early game is create a district on a resource. So say you've just unlocked husbandry and there's some horses but you're busy building your emblematic quarter, the Merrill Pyramids. We'll go over those in a moment. You're busy building those but you also really want those horses because, you know, your enemy is, is using something that has a lot of archers and you need to run them down with your horses. Or maybe something to do with copper or whatever. If you spend this influence to instantly build that strategic resource or, you know, maybe it's on gold and you really want the gold, you could instantly build it. You also get a bit of money out of it, so you can spend that money on creating the unit or, you know, buying the district out. Um, it's probably the only place where I think influence may be worth spending in the Ancient Era. Not a whole lot, though. Not a whole lot. Uh, their affinity bonus meditation, sorry, mediation is not amazing in the Ancient Era. It is phenomenal when you get into later eras, but in the Ancient, it just isn't that powerful. What it allows you to do is all of the trade goods that you are purchasing from other civilizations, third parties can go and buy those goods from you instead of the origin civilization and that just really boosts the amount of money you're making by a significant degree merchant is fantastic in that um but not much in the ancient era because just trade hasn't occurred enough to make this worth it um when you get into the classical it, it starts getting better and then later on it gets better and better and better as time goes on um, as long as you have people that are trading with you and not the person you're trading from. Uh, it's it's fantastic, but not so much in the ancient. Moving on to their uh, bonuses. Uh, throughout the entire game, you're getting plus five money on luxury resources and plus five money on strategic resources. Really good. Um, money, especially in the ancient era like this, this works better in the ancient era than it does in later eras. It doesn't scale massively well, uh, but in the ancient era, you're getting 
a l you don't have that much money. And if you have a lot of money in the ancient era, you're able to buy out districts, you're able to buy out units and really boost your power above what it otherwise should be. So getting basically a lot of money, let's be honest, that is quite a lot of money if you, um, you know, starting out in a, a decent location is really good. This will last you the entire game, but again, it doesn't it doesn't scale massively. What does scale massively is the Moreau Pyramids. Uh, this counts as a market and a maker's quarter, giving you industry and money, and it's fantastic. Plus three money for adjacent maker's quarter as well. You build a Moreau Pyramid, you just surround it in maker's quarters, you're making a lot of industry and a lot of money for it as well. Uh, these are emblematic districts that will last you the entire game, and you will be happy for them. Nubians are a phenomenal ancient era sieve because of the uh, these buildings. And finally, we have the Tassetti Archers. They are really, really good. They can shoot at a target without having a clear line of sight to it. You do still need to be able to see it, so other one, other units need to be able to uh, see it. Um, so your archers are really, really good. You can fight over forests and mountains and hills and such, and basically be able to position these units where they can't be return fired by your en the enemy archers. Um, Tassetti archers are really, really, really good. Also 19 strength, nothing to sniff at. So these are really good. This is fantastic. This is great in the early era. Uh, this is finally one of the only ones that is worth it with their um, affinity action. The Nubians are on the border of S and A. Right? I would put them behind the Egyptians and the Harapans. I would put them ahead of the Babylonians. I think at this stage I might slot them in the last place in S tier, but it's really close whether they belong here or here. I'm not, I'm not sure. Um, we'll see how A fills up, and then maybe we'll come back to them. But right now I'm going to pop them in S tier. They are one of the really good sieves. Moving on, we have the Olmex. And the Olmecs are our first Asthete sieve. I think that's how you pronounce it. I really don't know. Uh, Asthete is um, basically all about your influence. And as we said, in the ancient era, influence is gold dust. And you want as much of it as you can get. Um, ideological proximity is always maxed out. Uh, which is really useful when you are considering the, um, the barbarians on the map. Right, You're going to be seeing these barbarians. You may be able to get some free cities out of them. By having your ideological proximity maxed out, then your influence will grow with them, and then 200 influence later, you've gained yourself a city. Um, this can be really, really good. This can be fantastic for you. Um, their cultural blitz, uh, I don't think in the ancient era it's worth spending the money on it, uh, but what it will do is give you a bunch of money for spending influence. Yeah, it's not worth it. Uh, but yeah, the, um, the affinity bonus is, is really good in the ancient era. Not so much in later eras, though. Uh, their bonus all through the game, though, is Natural Harmony, plus one influence on territory. This is great, especially in the ancient era. Like I said, influence is gold dust. And the more of that you have, uh, the more you can expand. This is probably the best sieve for early game expansion and you know, getting a large amount of territory under you. Uh, you will be gaining more influence than any other sieve in the early game uh, with Natural Harmony and also with your Olmec Head which will give you plus one influence and plus one influence per adjacent farm farmer's quarter. It also counts as a farmer's quarter, which get um, bonuses for being next to other farmer's quarters. So, oh my head, surrounded by farmer's quarter is fantastic. You've got food, you've got influence, you'll be able to grow your population while also growing your country. Um, so, fantastic stuff. Javelin throwers. These are awkward for me, right? They are not very good at range because while they do have three range on their throws, they have to have direct line of sight, which means that they cannot fire over the heads of their allies um, unless they're on a hill. Um, it's very difficult and awkward to use javelineers, uh, either the javelin throwers or the javelineers that we'll see in a later era. Um, they're strong, but it's it's difficult to use them. They are strong growing forest tiles. They'll get an extra bonus there. And there is quite a lot of forests around the map in certain places, so you could get very lucky. But you also could be in somewhere with a desert or uh, the snow, and there might not be much uh, in the way of forests. So you might get unlucky. Um, 
it's hit or miss. This do this is not something that gives them a boost. Uh, these two definitely giving them uh, a boost in the tier list, but the gem throws. I just I don't rate this, and this is my tier list, so I get to decide. I'm going to put them a low A, bordering on B. Olmex A to B seem about right for them. Finally, we have, well, not finally, we've got two more, but we next have the Phoenicians, another merchant civilization. Same bonuses as we saw in the previous one. Uh, what they have is plus too many per trader on a city or outpost. Traders are probably my least important of the um, places you can put a pop in a city. Um, it doesn't give you as much as you really would expect, in my opinion. It's okay. It doesn't really scale well in the early game, and it's not really scaling well in the late game either. So I just I don't see this as massively valuable, if I'm being honest. Uh, their haven is pretty decent though. Uh, we have money per adjacent coastal water, money per adjacent lake. Um, these are pretty good in the early game if you can if you can spawn yourself near some coastal water or lakes, of course. Uh, as they count as a market quarter in the late game, oh not the late game in. In the areas where you can build things like uh, the harbors or the Kothon if you're Carthage, um, building bees next to the Haven, just really doubling down on your emblematic quarters bonuses is really good. Um, also, you know, it counts as a naval building. Uh, it's a naval spawn unit. Um, plunking one of these down next to a Kothon and next to a harbor, just really, really boosting that adjacency bonus maybe you putting some market quarters on the coastline or maybe if you become the dutch later on you can put a voc warehouse uh, next to the haven and the coast at the same time you can be making 50 100 gold from this little trio of districts so if you can use these properly the haven is really really good it all depends on location though um whether you are going to be able to do that uh, being able to put two havens next to each other as well if you're on the border of a, uh, uh, a couple of regions um, You know it can be fantastic, but it also really requires a very specific set of terrain to work at its best uh, It also has the Byreem, uh, which I don't really rate too well um, It's not a, a boat that can go into uh, deep water and naval combat in the early game just doesn't doesn't really exist. Uh, the Byrium isn't something I've ever seen used by the AI, by another player, or even by myself. It just, it just ain't that good. Uh, so putting all that together, I'd say the Phoenicians are like a low B because of the Haven. Um, a low B, high C. I think we're gonna go for now with like, we'll go like with a C perhaps. I think, I think that's probably where these fit. But I like Phoenicians, they're, they're cool, but yeah, they just, they don't scale well, uh, their unit is pretty garbage, uh, but their emblematic quarter is pretty cool. Finally, we have the Zho, the Zhu, Zhu, the, I don't know how you pronounce this, they're basically ancient era Chinese. And again, they are another um, civilization that is all on aesthetics, however, they're kind of not at the same time. Um, because none of their bonuses actually give you anything to do with influence. They're an influence sieve with no influenceness. Initially, I and a lot of people thought that this was pretty bad. Um, however, I've kind of come around to it. Plus two stability on districts. This means that you can have um, basically one free district every five districts you build. And that kind of adds up, right? You're going to be having a lot of districts um, if you play the game till the end of the game. And getting that plus two stability, it's not terrible, right? You can you can definitely use that throughout the entire game. It's not something that drops off. It's it's useful throughout. Um, and if you choose the Italians later on, you're really going to double down on this. The Italians are an industrial era civ who also give um, in uh, stability on districts. So that's really really good. We then have the Confucian school. Uh, their emblematic quarter giving some stability. Obviously, it's, it's really nice to get more stability. Uh, not really something that impacts in the ancient era, but these guys don't go away, and you're going to be having a lot of, um, you know, a lot of, of luck with them. Um, 
Confusion School also gives science and science pr adjacent mountain. Now, this is a civilization that really requires the correct terrain. If you have mountains near you, especially a mountain range, uh, if you have um, mountains stretching over many different regions that you own, the Confucian School is phenomenal and you will get a ton of science from it. Um, things like 20 to 30 science are not unheard of if you have the right terrain. And despite being an aesthete civ, the Zhu in the right location will be more science oriented than the uh, Babylonians. It is really, really good. But again, it requires the right terrain. If you don't have mountains near you, the Zhu are utterly garbage with no real redeeming qualities. I mean, the Harmonious Thought is, is really good, but you know, the this Confucius School, if you don't have a mountain, don't bother building them really. Finally, we have the Zanshi, uh, a chariot unit, which is really good. Bonus combat strength when stability is high. In the ancient era, you're probably going to have high stability, especially when you have Harmonious Thought and the Confucian Schools. So you're going to be having a good time with these. Um, they're also needing copper and horses, so just bear that in mind. Um, it's a good, it's a good unit. It's a good ancient era unit. You're going to have some uh, good times with it. Uh, the Zhou, the Zhu, the, the Zhao, however you pronounce it, I'm going to put as if you have mountains. A. If you don't have mountains, low C. Um, so I think a high B is really where they deserve to be. Um, and that is all of the ancient era civilizations. So going back to this, would I move people around a bit? I think I'd pop Assyrians down. i pop the Hittites down. And I think I would be pretty happy with that. Um, but yeah, that is all of the ancient era civilizations. And we're going to put a cut in this video now because... It's been going on for quite a while. I didn't expect to be taking 37 minutes on just the ancient era. So I guess we're going to be doing this in era episodes. So please come back in the next episode where we will be looking at the classical era and figuring out what's what to take, what is good for you. Uh, so please do join me for that. Thank you very much for watching and good luck out there in humankind. Bye bye.